this is uh, Mario Casabona, and welcome to Bullpen 21. Um, great day to be here, even though it may be a little bit uh, cloudy outside. Uh, so again, I'd like to welcome you uh, for attending. I'd like to uh, first, uh, again, introduce myself, Mario Casabona, co-host and uh, founder of TechLaunch. Um, and my co-host will be Robin Baer. Um, uh, she's a strategic advisor for startups and middle market companies, also an advisor and a senior mentor at um, TechLaunch. Um, and the uh, web producer, who's the uh, person behind the scenes, is Eric Korb. He's a uh, successful entrepreneur as well as an advisor and senior mentor at TechLaunch. And again, he's the uh, webinar producer. The uh, next slide, please. On the TechLaunch's mission, overall mission, is to commercialize emerging technologies by finding and nurturing seed stage tech ventures to accelerate growth via coaching, mentoring, networking, and access to resources, and more importantly, capital. Next slide, please. And, and how do we execute the mission? Well, uh, the first one, uh, the uh, business accelerator. Well, let me, just a little bit of history. Back in 2012, uh, yep, almost uh, over almost 10 years ago, we created New Jersey's first tech accelerator providing seed capital and mentoring through a 16 week accelerator program. And this was done in collaboration with the New Jersey EDA and regional uh, angel investors. And at that time we launched and funded 26 ventures and we had about 150 mentors in our network. Today, uh, actually back in 2017, we pivoted to a new business accelerator model, which provides mentoring, quarterly pitch events. Um, and since then, we have mentored over 100 seed stage ventures and over 21 pitch events. This is number 21. The other is the startup bootcamp, uh, which we created uh, for, a, um, for startups. We can program for aspiring entrepreneurs for thinking about starting their own venture, or in some cases, actually wanting to better understand what it takes to be an entrepreneur. The boot camps have been very effective for training, networking, building relationships, and building relationships among aspiring entrepreneurs. Hopefully, when we start having in person events and programs, we'll reinstitute uh, the startup uh, boot camp weekend. And finally, the office hours program, um, which uh, recently and in response to the much needed mentoring during the COVID-19 lockdown, we created a weekly free office hours program to provide mentoring and coaching. All these activities and initiatives are focused on growing New Jersey's entrepreneurial startup ecosystem with homegrown successful entrepreneurs and investors. Next slide, please. And now with uh, pleasure, great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our, uh, well, we're gonna do self introductions of our panel. Um, so uh, David, uh, if you don't mind, can you uh, please provide a brief introduction? Sure, Mario. Uh, I'm David Stengel, founder and CEO of Board Plus Plus, which is uh, focused on helping startups that want more diverse boards source uh, talent that will give them diverse board. Uh, I am also the founder and chapter director for Princeton Startup Grind and host uh, startup events to help uh, aspiring entrepreneurs get the uh, education access and context that they need to succeed. Glad to be here, thanks. Great. Thanks, David. Jessica? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Gaffney, and I'm the founder and CEO of WaveWork. I have a 20-plus career in the sports and entertainment hospitality industry, and six years ago, founded WaveWork with the vision and intention to improve the customer experience in professional sports. 
And uh, WaveWork Concierge is a SaaS platform that drives down costs, creates greater efficiency, and improves the human experience. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Sharon? Hello, everybody. I'm Sharon Waters. I'm the Managing Director of Jumpstart and J Angel Network here in New Jersey. I also have a um, business of writing and editing for various clients as well as media outlets. Previously, I worked at Montclair State's Entrepreneurship Center doing marketing and communications, and I also was a journalist for 12 years before that. It's great to be here. Thank you, Sharon. And Will, you're on. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Will Lutz. I am the general manager for entrepreneurship at the New Jersey Innovation Institute, which is a subsidiary of the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark. We run the state's uh, largest startup incubator. Uh, before this, I was uh, a four-time entrepreneur with a couple exits. And before that, I was a nuclear engineer in a submarine. So uh, that's me. <laughs> no wonder you're very radiant. That's that, yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's just, <laughs> I'm letting it all out. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Uh, next slide, please. And, and it's also now my pleasure to uh, briefly introduce our uh, event partners, uh, Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network. Uh, it's the uh, premier angel group in the Mid-Atlantic region with over 35 members. Typically, uh, we, I also am a co-investor or a participant in Jumpstart New Jersey. Uh, typically, uh, the investment ranges from 100,000 to about a million dollars. Um, then the other is Tech Council Ventures. Um, well, they, they have well over $50 million under management. They invest in early stage technology companies also in the mid-Atlantic region. Casabona Ventures, uh, which is my uh, micro um, uh, fund. Uh, we have over 30 tech companies in its portfolio. We invest in seed stage tech ventures um, initially uh, initial and follow-on investments range between twenty-five to one hundred thousand dollars. Our focus is on med tech, digital health, materials, and more broad, uh, more broadly, IoT. And then our um, um, uh, Gibbons Law, our uh, other, uh, our legal uh, partner, is a nationally recognized leader in uh, corporate law that regularly advises early-stage businesses. Uh, they have over 200 uh, attorneys. Uh, Gibbons is a leading law firm in the East Coast and ranked among the nation's top 200 by the American lawyer. And then Witham, uh, the accounting firm, uh, also uh, known as Witham Smith & Brown, but, but now Witham, uh, is the 26th largest accounting, tax, and consulting firm in the country. Uh, and has had group, a group focused on startups and emerging growth sector for over 20 years. Gerhardt Law uh, is a full service intellectual property law firm supportive of early stage ventures, specializing in patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and copyrights. And I, I really want to thank them uh, our partners, um, primarily because of the uh, advisory the $15,000 award of advisory services, plus the opportunity to the win of the winner to actually present at a Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network and the Tech Council Ventures um, and get valuable feedback and hopefully some funding. So now at this point, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Robin and uh, she can uh, take over the program. It's all yours, Robin, thank you. Great, thanks, Mario. So welcome to everyone. Uh, we've got a great lineup for you this afternoon. Um, we've got three very unique, very different companies that you're going to hear from soon. Um, but for now, I just want to run through uh, how this event will work. Um, each pitch, each founder will give a seven minute pitch presentation, which will be followed by seven minutes of Q&A from the audience. So for audience members, this is your chance to ask questions, um, maybe uh, drill down a little deeper 
paper on a particular topic you want to know more about that you felt um, wasn't covered, seven minutes is a pretty tight time frame. So um, feel free to put those questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have seven minutes. I'll try to pick up your questions from there and we'll try to go through those um, and, and get to as many as we can. Um, that portion will be followed by seven minutes of feedback from our panel of judges. And I will go through and call each judge uh, who will have two minutes to provide um, some constructive feedback uh, on the pitch. What the panel will be looking at um, is eventually they'll be voting on the most fundable. They'll be evaluating each pitch on five main metrics. They will be looking at the team. Uh, is this the right group of people to execute on this concept? Is there the depth and breadth of expertise uh, within, this, within this organization? They'll be looking at product. Um, has this company demonstrated a minimally viable product in the marketplace? Do they have certain metrics of success that, um, that they can demonstrate already? Um, is there any kind of unique intellectual pro property around the product or service? Um, they'll also be looking at market size and need. Um, this is the total addressable market, um, how well the, the startup intends to address that market, um, and any kind of um, metrics that they've uh, already demonstrated, um, uh, as well as how that factors into their revenue build. They will also be looking at the capital raise and use of funds. Uh, so this is um, what steps have they taken to raise funding already? Um, what kind of limited uh, fundraising have they already shown? And then with additional funding, how closely does that tie in to key milestones uh, that they project? And then finally, uh, each founder will be judged on overall presentation quality, on articulation, presentation of the topic, uh, and, and how clearly and um, how successfully they present. Uh, and again, the winner gets to pitch at uh, two different groups, Jumpstart, New, Jumpstart NJ uh, Angel Network and Tech Council Ventures. And with that, we can go to our first presenter. Uh, so first up, we have Cultivate Health Systems. Cultivate Health's hands-free healthcare voice assistant technology called EMT Assist understands patients' unique needs and provides relevant, actionable guidance for emergency healthcare clinicians in the field. We also collect and report real-time interoperable data, making the healthcare networks more efficient and safer for greater pre-hospital experiences with more positive patient outcomes. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of mentoring Cultivate Health, so I'm pleased to introduce Owen Burns, founder and CEO. Owen? Great. Thanks, Robin. I appreciate that, and, and it's a pleasure to be here. So I founded uh, Cultivate Health based on our voice assistant, ENT Assist. It allows uh, frontline healthcare clinicians, EMTs, paramedics, to interact with care goals. We also bring in the patient healthcare record and clinical data, and we, that gives us a full view of the patient, what's going on, right? And we take this data and we communicate through the healthcare system. Now, I have to tell you, when I talk to people about this, they say, that doesn't exist already, and it really doesn't. And I'll, I'll tell you how I came about this, so next slide. Okay. So um, I'm a business development technologist by trade, and uh, I became an EMT, an emergency medical technician, after my neighbor's daughter, uh, Maddie, featured here. Uh, she passed tragically of toxic shock syndrome, of all things. It's something you just don't hear about today. And it was devastating for the community. That got me involved in EMS. I, I started volunteering. I became an EMT, an officer, and uh, subsequently a, a board of trustees. But it wasn't long after I graduated the top of my class, I realized how hard it really is to diagnose in the field and understand what's going on. So that uh, got me really involved. I also stayed in touch with Maddie's mom because she was the genesis of why I got involved in this. And she said, you know, there are two reasons, two things, questions that could have been asked that could have saved Maddie's life. Again, she died of toxic shock syndrome, but had they asked, well, was she menstruating at the time? And were these flu-like symptoms uh, brought on the onset around that cycle? And the answer is yes, we would have been able to stop the shock, but how could we have not asked those simple questions that really ought to have been asked of any teenage, door, uh, teenage girl, right? So that, that's really how this started. And it would continue to drive this. But as I said, it is difficult to uh, um, treat it in the field. 
Um, as we see, there's also a, a trend here that's just growing on. It's called uh, decentralizing of healthcare. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid has instituted an ET3 protocol, which is to triage, treat, and transport. This is already in effect and has gone forward. And essentially what that means is folks like myself are asked to move people outside of the ER. Just don't go to the ER, go to patient urgent care, physician office. This is the new healthcare. This is actually in motion today and it's being funded. Um, this is going to bleed into other areas, community healthcare, right? So we're going to see it go into home-based healthcare. Oh, my, my dad's got uh, a heart racing. He needs high blood pressure. Can you come out and check it out? This is what's actually already transpiring. So um, this is going to grow our market. Uh, but think about that. We've already, this market is going to grow. But we've already identified an issue where we're not able to communicate. It puts a tremendous burden on that uh, person. That's why we created this health bot. Next slide. So this, uh, that's what came up with EMT Assist. EMT Assist is a voice assistant that uh, has a Q&A with protocols that are coded and made available. Uh, patient medical history is brought in, clinical data, and then we bring in medical taxonomy. It's an AI taxonomy that allows us to say it's more this than that, right? And that's how we're able to come up, ask those two questions. That's how it could have been brought into play here. Uh, we then take this data, we put in secure blockchain and uh, communicate that through this system. Uh, so this MVP is already built. It's available. We've, I've saved lives with this myself, uh, and it's been tested and deployed. I'll give you a use case that's actually currently in play. Uh, I can't tell you the name, but we're working with a major 911 call center, and they're looking for us to integrate with their data, right? That saves us a lot of pickup time and creates this continuing uh, record of care. We take that data, we put in the blockchain, interact with the Q&A, medical history, and we transfer all the information into the healthcare system, right? Again, continuity of care for greater patient health care. So it goes to the physician office, hospital, wherever they end up going. Next slide. So um, let's look at the uh, market opportunity. It's a 22 billion global EMS, EMS market, 5 billion US, $500 million addressable market. But we know that that consists of about 30 million transports a year. Now we know about 80% of those are gonna go elsewhere outside of the ER, right? That's pretty, there's a lot of decisions that are gonna be made by myself and other folks like me around the country. That's pretty, a daunt, that's a daunting task, right? Additionally, we, when we talk about this other side, that healthcare market, um, home healthcare and clinical, that's another market that is all upside. That's about a $500 billion market. So there's a huge upside on this. Uh, next slide. So what we're gonna look at is, uh, how do we define ourselves in the $8 trillion healthcare market? We had to be, uh, try to quantify us here. So we're online media consultation, symptom tracker, real-time EMS communication, AI chatbot. So this is a very new concept. It's fledgling area, it's growing. And so we're kind of in there, but there's a lot of competition around us, right? Uh, the closest one is Pulsera, where they have uh, some clinical capabilities and they're able to focus, they focus on a high acuity, like the strokes and heart attacks, and we're focused, focusing on the broad spectrum. Next slide. So where are we and where we're going? So we've built the MVP. We have a proof of concept we're integrating currently. Uh, we're looking for $1.2 million to continue to see this product. And that will allow us to finesse the uh, medical taxonomies, which is essential. We have to get this right. There's no wiggle room on that. Integrate with the APIs that we have in play with the major healthcare providers and continue to build the pilots. Next slide. So um, we have detailed financials, but uh, this is based on a subscription model on how we scale this business to become a, a $60 million annual sales business in just five years. Again, that's based on a subscription model. Next slide. And we're happy to provide this information. Uh, the team is really the essential part here. Um, I'm a Seton Hall University grad, and I've been an entrepreneur uh, many times uh, throughout my life. Uh, and Jen Gold is a uh, data uh, security specialist. She consults for the uh, FBI, Homeland Security Department of uh, Defense. And U.S. Marines as well. Nick Bucarelli is a Cornell University professor, focusing on cloud architect and AI. Anatoly Proteko is from the Ukraine. He's a crackerjack on uh, clinical and uh, pulling up APIs and integrating. Uh, he's helping us on that regard. Dave Robinson is worth a financial, uh, major financial institution, uh, senior exec, but he's an iOS expert and is helping us also on the voice, voice capability. Phil Frolic is, a, is the president of InfraGuard, who's keeping our data safe here in the Northeast. He works uh, very closely with the FBI and Department of Defense. Both Phil, Anatoly, and myself are all emergency medical technicians. Uh, Danielle Hogan is um, a graduate student of um, um, with marketing, helping in that regard. 
uh, Patty and Harry are uh, external, uh, our CHAP uh, consultant and digital health. Uh, our advisors are Chris Harrison and Bill Bartzak. Chris Harrison is a C, both are experienced entrepreneurs, uh, very successful. Uh, Chris is CEO of uh, Elson uh, Data and Bill Bartzak is uh, CEO of um, AccuTitle and he's also experienced in medical uh, field as well. Next slide. So um, where's our, what is our exit strategy? So these EPCR companies are essential to uh, recording information in the field. We're Owen, Owen, I'm sorry, yeah. that's uh, time. Okay, thank you. Sorry to cut you off, but we no have to stick to seven minutes. Totally appreciate it. Thank you very much. So at this point now, um, audience members, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, we've got another seven minutes for audience Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, questions could be things about, um, about market. It could be things about technology. Um, so please go ahead and drop your questions in there. I'm gonna pick up uh, the first one, which says, what are, oh, and this one, what are the issues around legal liability that may arise and how do you address them? Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing that. I'm guessing that's around um, legal medical liability. Yeah, you know it's it's a one of the first questions we asked ourselves, and we spent all the time. In fact, I've spent a lot of time professionally in this area as well. But certainly, liability is the key thing, and when you get into the medical field, uh, we're dealing with HIPAA servers, or the data for one, and then the liability. We are actually uh, using the uh, vetted uh, standards and protocols, uh, and so we're not infecting those necessarily. Uh, and then when it comes down to the clinical data, we have. Uh, government sources that we're using, and we're using the ratios, the quantified ratios on this. So we're not necessarily inventing that, we're using mathematical algorithms to pull up, hey, it's more this than that. At the end of the day, it's really the EMTs or frontline healthcare clinicians to make that judgment call, but it gives them that, that op, just as with Maddie, hey, it, maybe she ask these two questions and just see how that goes. That's a better spot to be in to not ask those questions. Okay, great. Um, we have some questions about uh, your financials. So I think if you could just take a minute to address um, how you plan to progress over the five years, where that revenue build is coming from, um, and and how you plan to achieve that growth. Sure. So obviously we want to talk, we want to talk about uh, what we're doing and not necessarily how and in a forum like this, but I think when we get down to it, this is a subscription model, right? So we're building year over year continue to build out that model for uh, going through those, those groups that we saw that we're marketing to, right? The healthcare providers, uh, for one, uh, individual groups can use this. We're working with associations and large uh, groups that are providing this healthcare. So it's subscription-based. It, it grows and it's modular and it continues to expand. We're working with uh, several of the uh, large, largest ones, and there's some real big ones out there that we're working with. Okay, great. I think that kind of ties into one of our other questions, which was, um, if you could address your target customers, um, and this comment says, have you considered working with providers to include as part of the healthcare package employers offer? Yeah, I think the providers are a really, uh, it's definitely a sweet spot. I think if we get that endorsement, it helps us across the board, right? And we are working with some of the folks right now, um, particularly in that community-based medicine. Um, <clears throat> a lot of those folks have already been uh, thrown into the mix here during COVID. They, they said, hey, we got to go out and, and, and come up with better ways to communicate and, and put people in the field that um, otherwise wouldn't have been there. So um, that is one of our target markets. Uh, but look, there's, there's a lot of groups that we're, we're speaking with and they're saying, hey, you know, we could really use this in, say, Arizona and we have a large EMS group that's very progressive. And hey, can we really use this? Other groups have said, hey, you know, we have um, uh, healthcare. We have nurses that are actually triaging. Can you work with this as well. So it's not, we're, Cultivate Health is a company as a whole. So if, if we, we have the opportunity to pivot and make these other services available and build in these other lines. So, but today we have a very focused group that we're executing. We know there's a need and we're getting terrific response on so far. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, it says your, your platform um, pulls, aggregates and pulls uh, data from many different data sources. Uh, and provides this data to users on various IoT endpoints. How are you dealing with data privacy issues to make sure that the the end user, the ones with the headset, uh, only get access, or or anyone using this data, only get access to the right data 
uh, that they should have access to and prevent data leaks. Yeah, that's key, right? So um, this is all based around HIPAA, right? Data disposition. And so um, I'm, again, we're experts in this and we have that our team is outstanding in this area as well. So, and particularly data security and data privacy, right? So there are issues, but as far as the internet things, how do we keep track of that? Um, that's really responsibility of the healthcare professionals, but we could share that within. So I can share with the hospital, I can have access to the patient care record, but that's my responsibility not to let that share. So that's where the HIPAA breach can go, right? But this uh, is interoperable data. And if you've been in this healthcare space, you know that this is a massive push in 2021 that there are mandates that data must be interoperable and that it needs to be accessible. And it's all in this cl closed uh, uh, system and all these gaps, all these risks have to be taken out, but they have to be interoperable and integrated through the healthcare system. So everything's changing in healthcare, but this is a new, horizon and uh, but you know there's there's a lot of things there's going to be issues Robin really I mean right with internet of things but at the end of the day uh, it, it's a necessary evil and I think uh, yeah, we'll just continue to run with the uh, making sure we're compliant and we're doing the right thing all across the board proper data security yeah I think that's an interesting point there that a lot of this um, market is being created by the government mandate for interoperable data. Um, that this is really um, so what's kind of opening up a lot of the need for um, plat different platforms and, and um, exchange of data and um, ability to transfer it from one source uh, to another. Um, I think, can you um, address how, did, the, did that mandate um, change anything in how you were uh, progressing? Did it cause a pivot or did it um, just play right into w what you were doing? Well, I guess we were a little bit lucky on this. I'm not going to lie, <laughs> honestly. But, you know, I've, again, I've, I've been in the healthcare technology space for a long time and uh, that was my expertise. So I'm very familiar with these trends which are coming up. But uh, look, I mean, who knew COVID would push this that much further, right? Telemedicine is commonplace. It's, it's everywhere. So this is the new normal and it's almost playing catch up right now. So this this concept of expanding into interoperable data, that mandate really helped. Um, and I think it's, it's only going to progress, right? If we're following other countries, other countries are more progressive, uh, Israel and uh, other pairs in, in the UK are, are much, much more progressive. So we're, we're a little bit behind, but we're learning from them. And we have some partners actually in this area as well that are helping guide us and, and helping how to, how to really optimize that. So it's been really helpful. Okay. Great, Owen. Thank you so much. Um, we're out of time for our audience Q&A. So audience members, thank you very much for putting your questions in there. Um, we're going to do this for another two rounds. So please remember, if you have a question, put it in there right away uh, so that we can get, get to it. Um, we are now going to jump to the uh, panelist feedback portion. And panelists, I'm going to call you one at a time, and we're interested in hearing uh, your thoughts and your feedback. So please frame it like, a, um, uh, like some feedback, some, some comments, some critique, um, and not in the form of a question. And the first up will be David. Can we get your feedback for Cultivate Health? Yes. Uh, Owen, I think the uh, presentation didn't uh, make the case for me on who the specific buyer was and what the specific problem was that you're solving. So uh, it's not clear to me if it's uh, better outcomes, uh, better interoperability to the EHR, uh, and if it's covered by payer activity, what, what that strategy is. So that made me... Uh, uh, have less confidence than I otherwise would. I think the uh, other piece is when you introduce voice technology in a in a noisy environment like uh, uh, EMT, uh, is that a point of difference? I didn't get a sense of whether this is really an expert system and it's the voice interface that's special sauce, or it's the better diagnostics and helping the frontline person who doesn't have the, the you know, Watson-like expertise. So those didn't shine through for me as strongly as I, I feel like they're probably there, right. but uh, that's my feedback. Excellent. Okay, 
Great, thank you, David. Thank um, you. Jessica, your feedback. Pardon me, on mute. I very much agree with David's feedback. Um, I echo some of the same sentiments. And I do, however, see the value in um, supporting the front line. You know, that's where my mind went with the voice chat, with the AI, uh, with the intelligence there to be able to facilitate the proper um, treatment in, in, you know, a more expedited time frame if they were given, you know, um, you know, more likely scenarios there. So, so that makes a lot of sense, but also, you know, definitely I am um, unclear on the business model in terms of how this fits in a, in a, you know, who, who's paying for it essentially to be blunt. Um, that's, that's where I also uh, was struggling, but overall, you know, it seems like uh, it would, it would be of great service uh, just, you know, needing a little bit more detail. Thank Thanks you. For that. Thanks, Jessica. Um, Sharon, your comments. Yeah, I too, um, as Jessica noted, had some concerns about the subscription model because I know that um, EMT squads are often strapped for cash. Towns that support them are strapped for cash. So making sure that um, your subscribers are going to be able to uh, afford this. I thought that, um, you know, I, the things I liked about the presentation, um, you know, you have, you say you, there's a 500 million EMS market, and then even beyond that, when you expand healthcare out further. One, another concern was, um, you know, you said yourself, there's a lot of competition. Um, and you mentioned Pulsara, that there are very specific where you're wider, but I think, um, you know, more analysis on the competition. And I know you only had seven minutes, but a presentation of how because a subscription model um, could be challenging to start with how you're gonna differentiate um, your product from the competition. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, and finally, Will, your comments. All right, I'm not gonna say anything nice about you because if I did, right. I'm not doing my job. <laughs> um, my, although there's plenty of nice things to say. The first thing I'd say is that in, in, in stylistically with the presentation, I would have liked to hear maybe a little earlier on a very quick elevator pitch of what it is you're doing. So I got a lot of context, a lot of story, and I found myself going, well, what is it that he does? I want that, that quick, like we're Uber for whatever, very early on to anchor me when you're communicating. And I think, I think that would have helped me go a long way, um, especially in the early on, of it, early on aspects of it. I'd like to see more about regulation and risk in the presentation itself, which somebody already mentioned, like, I am not a healthcare guy. This is not my industry. And as a software guy who's now dipping my toe in healthcare for seven minutes, I'm going, what does the FDA say about this? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And as the founder and CEO, I want you to make me feel like you're the expert in that and that's handled. Um, when we're talking IoT, chatbots, AI, that sort of thing, one of the questions that always comes up for me is physical versus software. Is it part of the business model that you're going to put a little Bluetooth earpiece in everybody's a little headset in every ambulance in America? So that's one thing that I'd like to hear maybe more about. Like, are you going to help them buy that? Is, you know, do you have the hardware picked out? Is it as someone, again, someone who's not in the space, does every ambulance have an Amazon Alexa installed in it? And I don't know. You know, like, so that's my thing. Um, the last thing, again, about communication, and this is sort of echoing the other panelists here, and this is my last note. Um, you're dealing with a very complex product and project, and you need to be able to much more simply communicate it. Because it feels to me like you're boiling the ocean a little bit. Interoperability of individual health records is a huge problem. And I'm worried that you're getting distracted by feature drift instead of executing on the vision that you're set out to do. And I think it is, I think it, I don't think that your actual vision is off. I think you're communicating it in a way that isn't getting that your vision out. It feels a little right. scattered. Right, right. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, Will. Owen, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Robin. All right. Panel, you have uh, two minutes to complete your scorecard to evaluate Cultivate Health. 
Um, and we will take this time to thank our senior mentors with Tech Launch. Um, you may have seen some of these folks on uh, some of the weekly office hours. Um, there are emails that go out once a week. You'll also see it posted to LinkedIn. Um, so um, try to keep an eye out for those if you're interested. Um, these are folks who volunteer their time to um, meet with startup companies, meet with founders, um, hear, the, hear a pitch, give a little bit of a uh, um, quick tips or quick suggestions and um, each one very often has a unique specialty or a unique area of expertise. Uh, so if you're a new founder in, in the audience here, um, take advantage, you know, uh, check out the bios and um, make an appointment. So these are some folks who are available. Okay, I think we are ready to move on. So next up, we have the club. The club is an interactive live streaming app made specifically for DJs and party goers. We help party goers find and attend parties that are happening in real time via DJ live streams. The club was mentored by Christian Osa and is presented today by Daryl Frader, founder and CEO. Daryl. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everyone. My name is Daryl Frader. I'm the founder and CEO of the club, live DJs and parties app. Over the past two years, I've been working with successful live streaming platforms in Asia that have been leveraging a unique business model known as in-app tipping. In June of 2020, I saw the opportunity to use this same business model here in the United States for a specific use case in the nightlife industry. Today, I've invested over 75K of my own capital to validate this business, developing a platform and establishing a community that will play a major role in the emerging creator economy. Next slide. Over the past year, DJs have learned a new skill, and that skill is how to live stream their DJ sets. Now they're live streaming and attracting millions of viewers, but there are several issues with current live streaming platforms that prevent DJs and attendees from having a great party experience. There are massive copyright issues, they lack the ability for monetization, and there's poor functionality for user engagement. Next slide. The solution to this is a live streaming platform designed specifically for DJs and partygoers. This has led me to create The Club. We're a live streaming app that helps partygoers find and attend parties that are happening in real time via DJ live streams. DJs and nightclubs use our app as a business tool to increase their exposure, revenue, and engagement with audiences, while partygoers use this as a social platform that helps them plan and enjoy their nightlife experience. Next slide. We move extremely fast. I came up with this idea in June of 2020, just a year ago this month, and just hit the ground running with everything I had. Three months later, we were able to launch the first version of the app on September 27, 2020. And to date, we have nearly 3,000 DJs active in our community. We absolutely love talking to our users that have built a strong community. We surveyed over 500 of our DJs and have interviewed over 150 of them on our podcast, which has given us tremendous validation of our value proposition. We understand their pain points extremely well, and we know exactly what we need to build next to make their experience even better within our platform. We've generated over $4,500 in revenue to date, proving out our business model. Next slide. Our product is simple. When DJs are performing, they create an event in our app to tell everyone where they're live streaming from. They start the stream and we make it easy for the partygoers to tip the DJs of which they can cash out those earnings very simply. This allows the DJs to better interact with in-person attendees while allowing people that cannot physically be there to also be a part of the party from the comfort of their homes. This flexibility allows for a more fun, safe, and lucrative opportunity for people to participate in nightlife. Next slide. We're a marketplace business, but we've broken down our revenue models uh, from the perspective of our different user types. So we're gonna start with the viewers. Uh, we capture value from our viewers uh, by encouraging them to send tips to the DJs for shout outs, song requests, and recognition, where we capture 20% of those transactions. Next. And next one more time. For our streamers and our venues, the DJs and venues um, use the club as a business tool to increase their opportunities to maximize their revenue. And we also allow them to upgrade their subscription from a freemium to tiered um, pricing uh, where they can get more business and monetization tools. Next. And brands. Brands use the club to get their products in front of live audiences where we help them insert physical and also digital product placement within live streams for a fee. Next. 
we're building a company that serves the emerging creator economy. And for those that don't know what the creator economy is, it is a new model where creators, people that create content in different types of ways to entertain people, can make money directly from their audiences. The current market size for the creator economy is estimated to be around $104 billion today and is growing at the same rapid rate that we're seeing of the gig economy. This has a projected future valuation in the trillions of dollars, and we're here right in the beginning of this. From my experience working with successful live streaming apps in Asia, I'm confident that we can capture at least 5% of this market over the next 10 years, being a first mover in this space in the United States. Next slide. We're not your typical live streaming platform. We're built specifically for DJs and partygoers to provide the best party experience available. Our closest competitors are Twitch, which is owned by Amazon, and Mixcloud, which is a music streaming platform based in the UK. Since last year, thousands of DJs have sought out these platforms to live stream their sets. But these platforms are not meeting their needs. There's tremendous demand for this to be fixed. So we're building features that allow these DJs to stream without any copyright issues, to maximize their opportunity for monetization, and to better engage with their audience so they can build their business. Next slide. We have a dynamic team of individuals with great startup and corporate experience. I myself, I just finished my MBA from the College of New Jersey, and I'm a second time mobile app founder. My co-founder, Dave Brown, he has a CPA, um, and he also has a master's in finance and taxation. Uh, we have great advisors as well, including Dr. Raymond Fu of innovation, um, AI Innovation Labs. He's a specialist in artificial intelligence, specifically with digital human interaction. Also, OG Arabian Prince, who is one of the founding members of famous rap group NWA, whose extensive network in the music industry has opened many doors for us. Next slide. These are our projections. We anticipate profitability by year two, and we anticipate to generate nearly $35 million in revenue by year five. Next slide. We're raising 500K, which will give us 18 months of runway. 250K will go to sales and marketing to acquire more DJs, leveraging, leveraging channels that we've already proven successful that convert at a CAC of $1.25, that's cost to acquire a customer. 150K will go to product development to continue improving and building out our product, um, utilizing a product-led growth strategy so we can attract more customers just with the quality of our app. And 75K will go to administrative costs such as streaming expenses and to staff our cash compensating employees, um, like Lorenzo, as you've seen on the previous slide, um, who manages our podcast. And this will allow us to hit key milestones, such as acquiring 1,000 paid DJ subscribers and our first 30 venue subscribers, which will give us a runway of a million dollars. Next slide. These are some of our acquisition channels of how we acquire DJs and build a strong community that we have today. We have a podcast where I personally interview DJs called the My DJ Story Podcast. Gives me great relationships with many DJs and it allows us to really build and understand their needs. We have a monthly DJ networking call and then we have various um, competitions such as our battle, DJ battle series. Uh, we're supported by many great organizations, um, including Mark Cuban companies who recently has started working with us. Next slide. Our users love the club. Uh, we have dozens of testimonial videos out there of them raving about how important our product is and they're just excited about it. So you can check those out on your own if you like on our YouTube page. Uh, next slide. And Daryl, that's time. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, we're now going to turn to uh, audience Q&A. So audience members, please put your questions in the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll pick up the uh, first question. Daryl, can you... Um, Describe a party goer. If they're not going to the club where the DJ is performing, are they congregating somewhere else or are they party going solo at home? So I guess um, in these times when nobody knows if a party is really virtual or in person, can you kind of explain a little bit about where this actually is taking place? Yes, so there's a number of use cases where people are using the club app as a way to kind of vet where they wanna go that night so they can see the live stream to say, oh, that place looks fun, that DJ is great, I wanna to go to that event. Or they can be at their home and decide to cast in the, the DJ live stream to their personal TVs and have five or six friends over their house. So there's a number of ways for people to party and be a part of the party using our app and really just participating in the nightlife. Okay, great. Um, how has your growth rate been impacted during the reopening? If you could kind of address um, 
you know, uh, what it was during the, during the pandemic when everything was closed. And now as you start to see things open, what kind of um, metrics have you observed about the reopening? Yeah, so it's been really great. We have kind of shifted our focus from just virtual events to hybrid events most recently. So we see a lot of excitement with DJs and the nightclub owners because we're able to see that they want foot traffic. And by using this as a way to expand their reach beyond the four walls of their venues, we're seeing that there is a lot of um, excitement around these hybrid events where some people want to you know, participate virtually or they want to have the option of going in person. Um, so we've been tracking and seeing growth in regards to the adoption of people wanting to use this as a hybrid way to, to, to um, participate in nightlife. Okay, great. Um, so we have a question about um, who can actually use this. Um, are the live streaming use, uses specific or limited only to DJs or can any musician at home use this or bands or um, you know, either a one person musician or a band? Um, can, can they also uh, get in on this and use this? Yeah, so we see live streaming as a powerful tool for the creator economy. And that includes all types of entertainers. Uh, so we see the importance of starting with a specific community, proving out the model, and being able to replicate that with other communities. So we're starting with the DJs because we saw a great need and also just my attachment to the industry allowed me to really get in there quickly and get a large community very uh, started very quickly. So uh, we definitely want to be able to add different communities of entertainers uh, for people to participate using live stream to build their business and make more money. Okay, great. Um, you know, a lot of your um, uh, focus in the pitch was on um, attracting DJs and, and sort of that was your, your market focus on attracting DJs. Um, can you address how you're also attracting the party goers? Um, because they're the ones who are actually, um, you know, supplying the tip stream. <laughs> so um, can, can you kind of talk about what you're doing to, to build that end? Yeah, wonderful question. To date, we're focused only on the DJ community because the beautiful thing about them is that they can serve as both viewers and streamers. Um, so as we are continuing to iterate and reaching product market fit, we're focused solely on attracting DJs to our platform and our community. As we you know, are super confident in our platform to go to market on the party goer side, we have plans to really be able to outreach and get a lot of these party goers to the platform, as well as have built an incentive for the DJs to promote themselves because that's how they're going to get tips and donations from people by allowing more people to come to these live streams. Uh, so building the DJ community is our foundation and it kind of expands outward from there. Okay, great. Um, how did you decide to focus on this aspect of um, closures due to the pandemic? How did you come up with this idea? Um, you know, was it prompted by the pandemic? Did you have it previously and this just um, nudged it? Um, talk about the, the origin. Yeah, so it's an interesting story. I didn't have too much time in the pitch, so I left it out. But um, my previous startup was an app for teenagers to play, plan and shop for prom. And with the pandemic, all the proms in the country pretty much got shut down. So um, what we did was host a virtual prom. Um, and we did it on Instagram Live and hired DJ Jazzy Jeff. And it went viral. Um, Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter, actually got involved. He made a $45,000 donation to our event and that kind of just opened my eyes to this business model that I've already been studying with these Asian live streaming platforms and gave me the use case that I needed to actually build my own platform um, to, to really turn it into something great. So I just kind of connected the dots and just went for it. Okay, so that's great. Um, those are all the questions that we have uh, in the chat. So I think we're gonna move, a, move on to the panel feedback. Um, so panelists, uh, we are looking for your comments and feedback for, uh, for Daryl about the club and Jessica, you are up first. Terrific. Hi, Daryl. Well done. I think that you presented extremely well, well-spoken, clear, well thought out, um, and congratulations. Kudos to you on having the vision and executing upon it so quickly and, uh, maximizing the moment, uh, with the pandemic. So well done. I do have some questions. Um, you know, half of the money you're looking to raise is to be allocated to raise uh, to to um, to get more DJs. And I know you talked in the beginning of your presentation about uh, community, and community really seems to be key to your success here. So I would have liked to see a little bit more about how you intend to spend half of that money on 
getting those DJs. So a little bit more detail there on the efforts on uh, the community outreach and, and getting those DJs, as well as, I, I don't know, um, in the numbers that you shared, you know, I know 4,500 revenue to date with 3,000 DJs. And I know, I think I also would have liked to see some examples perhaps with the freemium model when you mentioned, you know, there is an opportunity to upgrade to a premium uh, with additional perks and recognition. So maybe just a little more insight into what does that even look like? Like what could be a potential example of a perk um, that somebody might be willing to pay for? Like how is that so uniquely differentiated from the free model that it is worth paying for? Um, so a little bit more there. Um, and just, I think in general, um, you know, fees on both sides as a viewer and a DJ, I, I'm perhaps I missed it, but I wasn't quite clear on whether there was a difference at all in terms of the fees um, for either party as a viewer or as a DJ. I know that they could receive tips and the viewers would be tipping, but I wasn't sure in terms of their fee to participate uh, what the difference was, but overall very well done. So con congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Sharon, you're up next. Yeah, I echo as well. I thought it was a, a really strong presentation. Kudos to you for starting a business during the pandemic. And um, I like that you said that you um, put 75000 of your own capital in. So I could tell your passion during the presentation, but then that also shows that you're willing to put skin in the game. Um, uh, similar to Jessica, I'd like to know more about the revenue model, um, you know, if you had more time. So you guys take a cut of 20% of the tips, but I have no idea like how much a tip would be. I mean, I'm thinking like a dollar or two, which then, you know, even if it's $5, you're getting a dollar. So I know it's probably a matter of the scale. So I'd want to know more the 4,500 you've already um, gotten in revenue and then future projections of what's the breakdown between advertising um, from other brands versus tips versus anything else. Um, and my clubbing days are behind me. But one thing that I really liked about it was um, the aspect of seeing into the club. Cause I know back when I was doing that type of thing more regularly, you know, way back analog, um, you know, you would wonder like, well, we're going to go to this place. Is it happening? Like who's there? Is there a good scene there? Or is it empty? Um, so I think that that's an aspect that you could potentially leverage even further as sort of like a byproduct of people, um, an additional benefit people would get as they used it. Thank you. Good point, Sharon. <laughs> to be able to see uh, into the club uh, in advance, unknown benefit. Um, okay, uh, Will, your comments and feedback for Daryl. Yeah, I got a couple questions and this was addressed, my first one was addressed by one of the audience members. Um, this is a two-sided market, right? You've got consumers and producers, or I, you didn't use the word producers, you used the word um, creators, I think. Uh, a lot on creators, a lot on DJs. Uh, and so the thing that I'm like question, like when I go home, my wife and I stick Hamilton on, I'm probably not your right consumer, right? And so my question is how many people are sitting at home going, man, I really wish I could cons like listen to some DJ music. I'm sure there's plenty of them. I would like to hear it in your pitch a little bit. I'd like to hear you address that a little bit. Uh, you did you did what you hit one of two of my personal pet peeves from watching so many presentations and pitches in my day uh one is tam sam and sam tell me what those markets are for you you know i don't like it's the number of djs that you can access using this marketing campaign i know what tam sam and sam are i i, I mean i teach this for a living but i want to know what they are for your thing don't give me the academic description give me your version of it the other thing that really drives me nuts is uh, we, if we capture 5% of the market by being first movers. Oh man, does that drive me up a wall? I hate it. Um, first off, first mover advantage was, was uh, the guys who wrote the Stanford study about first mover advantage have come out and written like a bunch of studies and said, hey, we moved, we guessed this, we, we messed this up. We don't want to be first movers. Um, and two, that 5% of the market, I don't know where that's coming from. That doesn't feel real to me. The amount of times I've had entrepreneurs that have just like no concept in reality come to me and say, well, if we just capture 1% of the market, we're going to be awesome. And so there's probably data behind why you said 5%. I want to hear it in your presentation. Don't pull that 5% out of thin air. Um, yeah, that's it for me. I have other feedback, but I'll throw it in a note for you. 
great. Thank you. Great feedback. Thanks, Will. Uh, David, your comments and feedback for Daryl. Sure. So, Daryl, first of all, um, much improved since the last time I saw the pitch. So, kudos for that. Uh, I think that uh, I, I agree with Will's criticisms emphatically. Uh, another thing you should look at is uh, giving uh, love to the, the audience, the club, and the DJ, right? So it, I can see the progress on the DJ side, but talk about how you're winning clubs. Talk about how you're winning audience because you really have three legs of the stool, as I understand the business. And then the last uh, thing is uh, you, you really have to speak to uh, how you're getting the video feed from the club, right? Is that, is that a hardware thing? Is that a uh, field maintenance thing? Is that how, what, what do they have to do? Because uh, it, it will set off alarms for people that have tried to manage hardware in the field. So good job. Thanks. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Um, so these are just some of the ways that you can connect with TechLaunch. Uh, we're on the web. Uh, there's Twitter feed. We're on Facebook. We're also on LinkedIn. Um, so again, if you are a founder and you are interested in getting involved and, and connecting with the advisors and mentors through TechLaunch, um, please reach out through social media and um, connect, connect with us. So Trusted offers a B2B solution for property managers to solve bad behaving, the problem of badly behaving guests. Our system seamlessly integrates with partner booking systems, processes the guest data to form a guest trust score, and delivers the result back to the property manager in real time. Property managers would mitigate guest risks and lower their cost of operation of rental properties. Trusted was mentored by Peter Kestenbaum and is presented today by Marat Sanmez, founder and CEO. Marat? Thank you very much, Robin. Um, we are in um, gas risk mitigation space of short-term rental. Uh, next one, please. Um, we all know the, um, uh, that gas risk problem has been unsolved in short-term rental. We've seen the Airbnb shootings almost every year. Um, uh, during pandemic, uh, unauthorized parties, illegal usage of properties have been skyrocketed along with the complaints by the host. Uh, more than one in every 10 property owners complain the, uh, about their guests. Next one, please. Guest screening alone is not solving the problem. We all know this. Trusted is bringing a very unique innovative solution focusing on the renter's behavior. This is the only way to bring trust to the sector. Guest screening focuses on the criminal data, which we know they are going nowhere. What we are doing is differently is that the, on top of guest screening, we are bringing relevant data, we are bringing reviews from the host, we are looking at social media, and we are bringing all relevant data points together through our proprietary AI engine, artificial intelligence engine, to produce one single metric for the guest and pushing it back to the host. This is the, uh, uh, as simple as I can explain this um, slide. Next one, please. We are gonna sell this to uh, independent property owners who is running their property on Airbnb, usually the one to 10 properties. Um, then we are going to, in large scale to our uh, booking system, bigger property managers. We will integrate their solution get booking data, process it, and push it back in real time. And before guests arrives, hosts will know who is coming to their home, basically. This is very seamless, friction-free integration. Next one, please. We have a product available on Amazon Web Services. We, we deliver our services through, uh, through Amazon. We have one pilot customer running for three months without any problem. It's a good news that just two days ago, Ohana Stay, a property manager in Hawaii, uh, accepted to be our second beta customer. Um, we have been paying our taxes for two years, uh, so we are a New Jersey-based um, company. Next one, please. Market is really big. In USA alone, our market size is, the serviceable addressable market is over $800 million. 
this is just a risk portion of the market. If you combine Europe, this will exceed $1.6 billion market that we can immediately access. And we are very well positioned to be in the uh, first one in this new category. Next one, please. What we are doing is to, to capture our market share from the market is that we are attending trade shows, we are using podcasts and we are using social media for the brand awareness uh, to address the uh, small property managers first. We will repeat this in every year in a larger scale, we are gonna um, hire direct sales staff and we will do European expansion down to town. But mostly we are going to use the social media to access the, um, uh, where, where our customers are we are a member of VRMA, which is a, a very prestigious um, association in the sector. We have a direct access to 10,000 emails of property managers that we are sending emails to arrange one-on-one -on -one meetings. Thank, uh, next one, please. We have a very lean startup, very lean company that we have built. We are charging property managers. We drive revenue from property owners. It is free for guests. We charge per transaction per guest. You will see a revenue pack between year four and year five. This is because we are going to introduce consumer version of the product in year four. And we expect to be a very positive revenue impact of that in year five in the following years. Uh, next one, please. We are changing the rules in the short term round risk mitigation sector, basically. Existing solution, our competition only focuses on the, they use the term bad guess. Bad guess would be offensive and, and not a good way of describing the bad behavior. We are changing this and we are using bad behavior because to us, any good person can show a bad behavior. A top notch executive would show a bad behavior in a short term rental. So uh, we are looking for bad behaving guests among good people while competition is looking for bad guys among the bad people that we know they are going nowhere, especially in the criminal database. We are also focusing on much broader database. Competition only screen like four or five million records of the, of the criminals. We are screening entire travelers database and we have much more superior artificial intelligence technology than uh, our competition is using. Next one, please. And this approach is welcome by the sector. We are here, we are getting very positive feedback from the sector leaders, thought leaders. I wrote, um, I wrote a, a three series, three article series on, on LinkedIn, and I'm getting very good feedback from the uh, thought leaders. I was invited as a guest speaker to an Airbnb hospitality club on Clubhouse. We are getting a very good traction from the sector. Next one, please. We have a deep experience team among the executive team. We have members who have been there, who, ha who has done this before. The Phil is our um, uh, domain advisor, also CEO of Future City. Future City is a local NG-based company. I think they have raised about $6 million uh, up to now. Uh, Phil is world-recognized thought leader in the sector. From product-wise, we also have a um, data scientists grew uh, who developed the model uh, using artificial intelligence. Uh, next one, please. Market is not the same now it was three, three years ago, and it will not be the same that it is today after five years. It is changing. Um, I think in five years, what we are anticipating is that there will be a great need for independent, centralized, cross platform trust metrics to call for short term rentals because Google is entering booking domain. Google is bringing more risky guests with no reviews, uh, no, uh, no um, verifications. Also direct bookings, online travel agencies, they all bring unverified risky guests. They will need us. Also number of property managers leaving Airbnb is increasing because as long as they stay on Airbnb, they don't own their business they did all their guests, Airbnb does. Murat, thank you, the t time is up, I'm sorry. Thank I have you. to cut, cut you off. Thank you. Okay, we are going to turn to the Q&A. So uh, audience members, please put your questions in the Q&A. I will pick them up from there. 
Um, we have a question, what do, if you can describe, you know, you, you talked about the difference between a bad guest and bad behavior. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit more about what is involved or what comprises bad behavior and how is what you do different than uh, some other platforms that are there like Airbnb, which already has a guest rating system. So what, what kinds of data are you pulling to assess bad behavior? Very good question. You, usually, uh, the reviews reflect the behavior of the guest. Airbnb, only 20% of the market. Airbnb, uh, sort of Airbnb, there are 80% of the property managers who, doesn't, who does not have any access to reviews. If you are outside of Airbnb network, you don't have access to any reviews. So what are you going to do with your guest? So we are providing Airbnb independent reviews and system for the independent property managers. The question is right. If you are on Airbnb network, you are covered from the reviews. Reviews reflect the behavior. Uh, and, and we are also checking social uh, media, which Airbnb does not. So this is the main differenti differentiation factor we are using. Okay, great, thank you. Um, what about uh, liability and liable from guests or possible mistakes in the assessment of bad behavior or possible mistakes that would go that would factor into that rating the guest rating um, and attached to that is how do you prevent um, or build in any kind of um, anti-bias in your AI it is it is um, totally anti-biased it is it is based on data uh, we don't introduce any artificial data to the si system. Whatever your reviews are, if you have five reviews, five, five reviews, it is affecting your uh, score positively. If you have one review, it is affecting your uh, score negatively. It is all it's all real data. Nothing nothing. Um, if you know, I, I mean, about machine learning, it works on the data. Uh, basically, um, uh, this is. Um, same goes with the current score. You might not agree with your current score, but we are using it. And also, we are not taking any risk and any uh, blacklist, gray list thing. We are getting the result and passing the result to the property manager. It is up to property manager how to use this data. We don't include the decision. Eventually, property manager will make a decision based on the data we have. Okay, and is this evaluation of the of the renter is it a uh, score driven rating, um, and can that score change over time? For example, a credit score can evolve and change and uh, change and go up and down. Can this score uh, also change? And um, answer that one first. Can this score change over time? Exactly, it is dynamic. It 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 depends on your reviews and be, behaviors and and your other parameters. It is very dynamic. You might uh, show a good score today, but tomorrow, if you are uh, have a bad review, it will change. So it is it will live with you. Your score will live with you uh, uh, with your dynamism in the short term rental uh, sector. So it is it is highly dynamic. It depends totally on your behavior. Okay. And does the guest opt in to, uh, to participate in this score? Um, or or how, do you, how do you ensure that you have all the correct data from your sources? Currently, we are using only the whatever digital footprint is out there. But in the year four, as I said in my financial projection uh, slide, we are going to introduce this to guests. So guests will involve to build their own score. Guess, uh, it, once we open consumer version, we will open this to guests. Guests will have direct control of their score of their uh, data. They will contribute directly. Okay. And this will happen in the fourth year, not, not immediately. Okay, okay. It's a uh, guest. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so we have a question about any proof points so far as to the effectiveness of eliminating bad behavior. So, for example, have property managers used this to, um, uh, and have they, has it improved their experience with renting to unknown guests where they have uh, reduced their incidences of, of uh, negative renters? Definitely. We have one pilot customer who's using this for three months constantly, 
entering the data, checking the gas, uh, and basically, well, they don't report back to us uh, about the data, how much they improved, but they're constantly using it uh, for three months. So that means uh, they have a, like, every week they have a new gas. We are having transaction in our uh, system. So uh, that must be uh, very, very um, useful for them. They continue using. And also we have second customer coming in. Uh, that's a property manager in uh, Hawaii, basically. He will be using the system. But we are going to collect this data down the road, uh, uh, testimonies and the uh, prevention rate uh, from the host down the road. It is, it is very early right now uh, to make a judgment on this. Okay. Um, given, given that your platform uses and relies on artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. is there some sort of critical mass that you need and some sort of inflection point that you need to get to um, before it truly be becomes 100% effective in terms of delivering on the value proposition? Or is there a, a future point at which it evolves and becomes something else, becomes something bigger and and grows into a different uh, in, into different offerings or um, different products? It's all data. We are shooting for first 10,000 transactions per day. This is a critical uh, uh, volume for us. Uh, 10,000 transactions is, is not a small uh, number. Once we have this, uh, system will live with data, will evolve with data. But we are really looking for this uh, consumer version when we introduce in the fourth year. Once we drive the gas into this, it will be a totally new game. We will change rules of the game uh, the, 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 in the, after the fourth year when consumer comes into the picture. We would like to be, if you will, experience of the short-term rental business. That's what we are shooting for. And we are very much putting down the fundamentals right now uh, to go there. Um, basically, I will answer uh, this question by saying that the once we have this data, we will be in the radar of the fintech companies because we are tracked, we are getting data points that they cannot get, basically. So okay. it, it, it will be a very different game uh, once we introduce a consumer's version in year four. Okay, uh, we have time for one last question. Um, with the trusted platform, are there any privacy law concerns regarding the exchange of renters and guests data? Uh, and is there a means for or a path for appealing any kind of negative feedback left about them? Mm -hmm. Very good question. This is the first thing we've ad addressed. Gerhard Law, your partner, um, drafted us our uh, privacy statement. We are GDPR compliant. GDPR is European uh, data privacy uh, compliance. In USA, we have FCR in the uh, California. Unfortunately, in USA, we don't have a centralized privacy law. But whatever we have here, we are being compliant to that and we are being compliant to GDPR. I think this is a good start for us legally. Uh, uh, but by the way, property managers and customers need to agree on our terms and conditions, privacy conditions, before using the system. Okay, great. Thank you, Marat. We are going to move ahead to, I'm sorry, and thank you, audience, for those questions. Uh, we're going to move ahead to the panel feedback. Um, and Sharon, you are up first with feedback for Trusted. Um, well, it's great to see that you have a beta product and that you already have two companies um, that are uh, our clients. Um, I had, um, I, my main question is, I feel like if, so you're targeting property management companies versus say like an individual who's renting out a room or renting out their house occasionally. Um, but I feel like that those um, property management companies would already have something in place. I mean, this Airbnb type model has been around for a while. So like Phil Kennard with Future Stay, like I would imagine he already is using something to in some way be vetting the guests um, for the properties um, of his clients. The other um, thing that I didn't understand was the social media post aspect, um, how that would work. And, you know, for example, my social media handles are all my name, but, you know, I would imagine that if somebody is doing posts and tweets that are offensive or hateful, um, you know, they're not using their name, right? They're using some sort of like, numbers and letters or something. So I don't know how you would match up 
um, social media posts uh, with the real person. Okay, thank you, Sharon. That's good, good feedback, good point. Um, Will, your comments and feedback for Trusted. Sure. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, my Reddit handle, by the way, is not Jonathan Frakes, because I'm a Star Trek geek. Um, so I have a couple notes here. The first is, um, Murat, I do not like your bias answer, man. Um, and that was a, that is a very good question. And in, in fact, it's something that we talk about at the university at the Big Data Institute quite a bit um, about accidental racial bias, gender biases that get kind of laid into AI and big data in a way that is unacceptable. And I really did not like your answer. And I really want you to, as you talk about this more, go, work on that a little bit is, is my suggestion. Um, one of the use cases that I would like to hear, and I think this got mentioned a couple times in the audience Q&A, um, so I'm going to kind of repeat it, is what happens when a guest's rating is really good, but their behavior is really bad. Um, if there's not enough data on them because they don't participate in social media and they don't have a criminal record, but they are organizing a bachelor party and they're going to be real jerks to that Airbnb. Um, that's, it, it is a case that happens and it can be a really bad situation for you. And so, and I, my guess is that behind the scenes, you have some way of mitigating that. Um, but I want to hear it a little bit in the presentation. Um, last note for you, traction. I like the traction of the existing customers, the two customer sets. I think that's great. Some of your other traction notes are almost by definition vanity metrics. Um, how many people read a LinkedIn post? That's not really traction. Um, and I, you have good traction. Don't distract me with, with vanity metrics. Uh, that's, that's my feedback for you, Moran. Okay, thanks, Will. Good points. Um, David, your comments and feedback for Trusted. So first I wanna uh, double down on Will's comments on bias. Your answer was really uh, terrible and uh, a, big, a big red flag. Uh, for the rest of it, uh, I think that talking about how you model the benefit to the renter and quantify it economically would have given me uh, more comfort with the model. So assuming that the the uh, rating works. What does that mean in terms of my costs? If one in 10 tenants is a bad experience, do you change that one in 10 to one in 20 or one in 100 or one in 11? Uh, what, what is your ambition there? Uh, I think you spent uh, too much time uh, talking about things that are happening four years out if I listen to a startup pitch and it's, hey, in year four, some amazing things are going to happen, uh, that doesn't make me want to open up my wallet. I want to know what you're doing in the next 30, 60, 90 days to, to get traction. So spend more time talking about the customers that have signed up and what their experience was. Uh, I felt your answer was more they're using it every day they're using it every day and how many rentals did it change? How many, how many applicants did they reject uh, that they would have taken before? That would make me uh, see how you're differentiating uh, what you're doing. Uh, the other comment I have is I thought you were onto something when you talked about uh, providing reviews for people that weren't air renting on Airbnb. And if you can say, hey, we're the review network for renters that aren't on Airbnb, and there's millions and millions of them, that's something that's very easy to hang on to as a tagline. Uh, and if that's true, you might consider highlighting it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Jessica, your comments. Great, Murat. So congratulations on the, uh, acquiring your second beta uh, customer. That's terrific. Um, I do agree with uh, a comment or two from each of the other panelists. 
Um, you know, I do, like Sharon mentioned, the social media, I do struggle with understanding the direct correlation between social media and um, how it would, you know, pertain to their, uh, to a guest stay. Uh, I also think, you know, I'm trying to understand clearly the property management company would find this, you know, rating system extremely valuable. However, it's really uh, the onus is on the property managers themselves to provide those ratings. So I don't see how within the time frame you've projected um, that much traction would be gained. It's going to take time for people to repeat stays. And, and, and unless you're capturing historical data on reviews from, from old, you know, historical stays, um, I just think it's going to take a little longer to, to acquire that. Um, but furthermore, there has to be almost a uh, handshake scenario where, you know, you, you mentioned a lot of the news articles that we see about the bad things that happen out there. You know, we hear news articles about uh, bad things happening from the property managers themselves, the people renting the properties. You know, there's bad people out there on both sides of the equation. So having right. the reviews of the property managers as well is extremely important so that guests can, you know, understand what their viewpoints are, just like, you know, any of us make choices on uh, reviews that we see. So that's my feedback. I mean, overall, I get it. Um, I think that, you know, some of the feedback shared in terms of better understanding closer proximity, like how to achieve the growth in six, nine, 12, 18 months um, would be helpful. But, you know, well done overall and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so thank you panelists for that, that feedback. Um, now is the time for you to fill out your scorecards for this third and final presentation. Um, so while you are doing that, I'm going to talk to the audience uh, about a few other things. So Tech Launch to date, um, the Tech Launch name is synonymous with New Jersey entrepreneurship. Uh, it was established in, as Mario said, in 2012 in collaboration with the uh, New Jersey EDA and a group of regional angel investors. It has served over 150 tech-focused companies, mentored over 250 aspiring entrepreneurs, and since 2017, held 21 bullpen events catering to more than 75 seed stage companies. Um, so it's very active, continues to be active, um, and hopefully is of service to the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the, in the state. So we, uh, let's see, next slide. So just some highlights from this particular bullpen pitch. Um, I always think it's a, it's a good idea to listen to what the panel has to offer. You know, they're giving their time and their expertise to comment on it. And I think there's a lot of value in what they say for other entrepreneurs in the, in the audience um, and, to, and to hear their comments about the different pitches. So a few key takeaways from that. Um, some of the, the points that they raised were, um, the challenges of a subscription model when you talk about a subscription model uh, to be clear about who's paying for that and how that subscription might change over time or the different levels and, and to really be more specific about those uh, that that structure that's there um, looking at the uh, the revenue bill the revenue model um, really taking a good look syncing it to your projections about your your market size um, really connecting your the scope of what you're the market that you're trying to tackle connecting that to the revenue that you're trying to build so there's a very clear direct connection there um, some of the other comments were uh, how to get from that big picture, that huge, enormous market, um, how do you really get from that down to what you yourself can achieve with the team that you've put together and the resources that you have? Um, and finally, uh, they've also touched on, you know, a number of presentations today had issues surrounding privacy laws. Um, you know things that are really could make or break a company um so things to think about that's something you want to be very careful make sure you get the right um uh, legal representation around you and really take a good look at how you're protecting yourself around um any issues surrounding privacy and data okay 
And again, just as a reminder, the prize today is an invitation to pitch in front of Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network and Tech Council Ventures. Uh, and they, the winner will receive 50, up to $15,000 of in-kind services from our event partners, Witham, Gearheart Law, Casabona Ventures, and Gibbons Law. And today's winner of bullpen pitch number 21 is Eric. Have a drum roll. The winner is the club. Congratulations, Daryl. And I just want to thank all the presenters today. Everyone did a great job. Um, congratulations to Daryl. And I'm going to turn this back over to Mario. I think uh, there we go. And Robin, thank you for uh, co-hosting. You, you did the hard work. I just did the upfront thank you. So again, congratulations to the winner, Daryl. Uh, you did a great job. Uh, the club, it's fantastic. I, I do want to uh, say that all the other, the, all three companies did a great job. Cultivate Health, um, thank you. I also want to mention the uh, mentors. Robin, uh, thank you for mentoring uh, Cultivate Health. The club was mentored by Christian Osa, trusted uh, Peter Kastenbaum. Thank you very much for uh, all your help uh, and your mentoring. Um, so uh, repeating, uh, Eric, fantastic webinar. Uh, we, another successful one, thank you. Uh, thank you to our panelists, David, uh, Jessica, Sharon, and Will for their constructive feedback. And it's interesting, another past um, uh, events, the uh, panelists' interaction with the um, uh, uh, presenters ended up being like a Q&A session. This really worked out very well. It was very good constructive criticism. So thank you very much, panelists. Uh, thank you to our event partners. Uh, I think with them, uh, Gibbons Law, Casabona Ventures, Gerhardt, Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network, and Tech Council Ventures. Thank you to our senior mentors and advisors um, again, uh, our whole, the whole network is over 150, but the senior uh, mentors that uh, I rotate every two to three to four weeks on the weekly uh, office hours, um, they, they do a fantastic job. They, they help bring in some of the companies, they mentor the companies, and I think they're adding um, a really good value to our ecosystem. And finally, uh, thank you to uh, the engaged attendees for the excellent and challenging questions. Um, your calendar, put on your calendar. The next bullpen, number 22, is scheduled for September 14th. Uh, applications for our next business accelerator program, which culminates in the bullpen, will be announced uh, soon. And uh, check out our website at techlaunch.com. And uh, one final is panelists and presenters, please stick around for a screenshot. Thank you very much and enjoy the summer to everyone and keep healthy. Thank you.